was warm for early May as the detective strolled into the crime scene. He couldn't believe this was the fifth murder of the year as he took off his fedora and looked over the body. Mount Vernon was a small town with less than 20,000 residents that averaged maybe one murder a year, and that was on a bad year. At a cursory glance, the victim appeared to have died from a blow to the head, just like all the others. Officers that checked the scene before the detective arrived reported nothing appeared to be missing, and there were no signs that the house had been broken into, just like all the others. At this point, even the chief would have to admit that they had a serial killer on their hands. Walking around the room, he took notes about the layout and how the body was positioned, hoping something would stick out. When he felt that he had all he needed, he signed the coroner's release form so the body could be moved and left. It was nearly dinner time and he wanted to grab a bite before heading back to the office. He stopped at his favorite diner, hopping on his usual stool and greeting the waitress with a smile. It was people like her that kept him doing this after all these years. Innocent civilians who only wanted to go about their lives, barely keeping up with the news of the latest crimes. She smiled and asked him about his day as she poured his cup, and he told her it had been a long one as he hid the truth behind his own rugged grin. Finishing his food, he left some money on the counter and made his way back to work. Walking into the station, he winced as he heard the voice of the chief. Fields, just in time. Please tell me this one was something new, he said, motioning the detective into his office. I wish I could, sir. The same as the other four. I mean the exact same. The wound was in the same spot. The room layout was the same. Nothing taken, no forced entry. It was like walking into any of the others, Detective Fields said, taking a seat across from the chief. I'm starting to think I might have been wrong then. Maybe we are dealing with one killer. We've got to keep this quiet for now. The public will panic if they find out. We can't give them anything to look out for anyway, so just fill out your report and drop it in the bin for now, the chief said as he stood up and grabbed his coat. The paper is already speculating. I'm not sure how long we can hold them off, Fields replied, furrowing his brow. If anyone asks, we're investigating all five murders, but we haven't linked them. I've got a dinner to get to. We'll talk more on Monday, he said, walking out the door. Detective Fields moved to his own office and started working on his report. The chief was a good man, but he was a little frustrating to work with at times. As the hour grew late, the detective's eyelids started to grow heavy. He hadn't been sleeping a lot lately, and it was beginning to get to him. He was about halfway through the report when he heard footsteps approaching his office. Perking up, he looked through the door, expecting to see someone walk in at any moment. The steps stopped just feet from the door, and he thought for a moment he was just hearing things. As he was about to get back to the report, he heard someone clear their throat in the hallway. <clears throat> Who's there? Detective Fields asked in a tired voice. After a couple of minutes with no response, the detective stood up and walked over to the door, peering into the hallway to find there was no one there. The hair on the back of his neck went stiff as he moved further into the hall, still seeing no one. I'm losing my mind, he said to the darkness of the quiet station. Turning around to face his office, he stopped cold when his eyes landed on a person sitting in his chair. The figure was a man in his thirties, wearing a suit and looking like he hadn't spent a day in the sun ever. A gold lapel on the notch of his suit bore an odd symbol and his hair was slicked back. He wore a broad smile on his gaunt face and his eyes were those of a man with secrets. G can I help you? The detective muttered. No, but I can help you. I know about the case you've been tracking, the murders of those five innocent people. See, I know a thing or two about murder. I spent time inside the minds of those who do it. You've been looking in all the wrong places, Jimmy, the man said, the smile on his face growing with each word. Uh, I... It's Detective Fields. If you've got information, I would be glad to hear it, but how did you get in here? Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. You're focusing on the wrong thing, son. How I got in here is the least of your concerns. You should be wondering how what I know is going to help you nail the son of a bitch. 
the man said, his smile fading. The detective eyed the stranger, trying to gather his nerve. The presence of the man seemed to have brought a chill to the air, and the sound of thunder outside only added to the eerie feeling. Okay, I'll bite. What do you know about our killer? Well, of course, it can't be that easy. You're a detective, after all, so you still have to solve the clues to find the perp. The man's smile returned. Why don't you start by telling me what you know about each crime scene, and I'll fill in some details. Walking over to his desk, Detective Fields picked up a pile of folders containing the case details and opened the top file, sitting in the chair across from the man. The first victim, Tina Holbrook, was murdered in her home on the north side of town. There was no sign of force entry. The coroner said she died from blunt force impact to the back of her head. There was nothing missing from the home, according to her family, so robbery was ruled out as a motive. Nothing was missing, but was there anything that didn't belong? The man asked. There wasn't anything that stood out as not belonging, and her family would have known. Are you sure about that? The man's eyes flashed as he spoke. I suppose there could have been something that they missed, but how... Detective Field started. Were there any odd symbols? Something that seemed out of place in the home of an old woman? The man interrupted. The detective thought back to the scene, looking through the photos in the file. One of the photos stood out to him now. One that included the coffee table the woman was lying next to. On it, there was a deck of cards scattered around with the numbers facing up. They all looked normal, except for one that had a black and white tree on it instead of a suit. The playing cards were a little weird to see, but they didn't really stand out at the time. We assumed she was just playing solitaire. Ah, but now you're starting to see it, the man grinned, nearly falling out of his chair as he celebrated. Looking at the second file, Detective Fields found the same symbol on the bottom of a coffee cup that had been tipped on its side. The third file showed the symbol in the center of the coffee table itself etched into the wood, and the fourth had it sewn on a doily in the center of the table. We don't have photos from the most recent scene yet, but I do remember seeing the same symbol on some stationery sitting on a table. I thought it was a company logo of some kind, Detective Fields said, now even more curious about the man's origins. It's much older than any company, and death seems to follow it around. It goes back to at least ancient Rome, though it could be a lot older. Can you think of anywhere else you've seen it? The man was now leaning forward in the chair, his hands clasped, his elbows on the desk. Looking around the room, Detective Fields tried to remember seeing anything like the symbol anywhere else. It looked familiar, yet he couldn't place it. Looking back at the man, he realized where he had seen it. Your lapel. You're wearing the symbol. You're sharper than you look, detective. But can you put all the pieces together? The man said, somehow moving from the chair to standing next to Detective Fields in the blink of an eye. It's a calling card. You left a calling card and no one even noticed. The detective was now frozen in place, unable to react to the man now towering over him. Right you are, Jimmy. I wish I had a prize to give you, but I guess some explanation will do before... Well, you know what has to happen. See, I discovered the symbol of Eretite decades ago. It was a funny little thing stamped on a card next to my mother's body. I chased it for years, hoping to catch her killer, only to find out it was a curse. You see, the one who wears the mark must pay penance for those that came before. Blood is the only acceptable currency, and only those who are unwilling can pay. At first, I refused the urge. I battled the demon for years before finally giving in to its will. But my time is up. Someone new needs to take it on so I can accept my blessing. Don't worry, detective. Think of it as a chance to see what the other side goes through. You'll be much better at catching killers when you are one. The man was now sitting inches from Detective Field's face. Unable to respond, the detective watched in horror as the man removed the lapel 
and pinned it to his suit. A warm feeling washed over him as the man smiled and disappeared. His arms and legs regained their ability to move and he reached for the pin, desperate to remove it. As his hands touched the cool metal, he hesitated. Why fight it? Hadn't the man said it was useless to resist? With a renewed feeling of calm, Detective Field stood up and walked to the door, grabbing his hat off the rack and shutting off the light. A smile crept across his face as he thought about what he was going to tell the chief on Monday morning.